Welcome to Small Arms Solutions. Today we're looking at something I've been wanting to get my hands on for a really, really, really long time. In 2017, Colt announced their new M16A1 reissue. And those of you who follow my channel knows that my favorite guns of all time of the M16 platform are the XM16E1 and the M16A1. Uh, of everything that's out there, those have always been my favorite uh, models of all time. So when this was announced, I was extremely excited. Except for when I heard what the price was going to be. MSRP of $2,499. And when I saw that, I was like, what the hell? I cannot imagine for the life of me what would have made this rifle worth that much money. The 2017 SHOT Show, uh, there were several uh, YouTubers who pretty much went right at the Colt representatives and said, how do you justify this cost? And I had recalled one of them saying how, well, first off, it was the cost for Colt to retool to make this thing. Mm -hmm. Uh, and second was, uh, they were doing just a limited number of these, so they were going after the collectors. And of course, everybody figured that, uh, because it had a heart for horsey on it, that they were gonna, you know, they were willing to pay that much money. Well, fortunately, the YouTubers that were, uh, there, you know, they saw really through the BS. Uh, the reality is the M16A1 reissue is another Colt Expanse. It's another gun that is manufactured by another company. Uh, to my understanding, that's by U.S. Armament. So this is basically a product that Colt does not make in-house that they loan their name out to. Um, and that's how they do it, the same as the Expanse. So uh, for that to go for $24.99, you know, I, I, I don't get it. You're not really getting a true Colt gun that's made in Hartford. What was really sort of uh, upsetting was the lack of attention to detail. Now, am I going to be critical on this gun? Oh, you better believe it. And the reason I'm going to be uh, extremely critical out of it is because of its MSRP of $24.99. If this rifle was sold for $1,200 or $1,500, I would be happy. I would not say a word. Uh, I would own one. Um, I would be praising it because, again, I love this rifle so much. But for $24.99, this thing better be exact to what this rifle was. And unfortunately, in a lot of ways, uh, it was not. There was a lot of very simple things that are very important to collectors uh, that were not done on this rifle. And, you know, just, just quite frankly, this this MSRP is just so way out of whack. You know, there's people out there who, you know, because it has Colt's name on it, they're going to pay it. You know, uh, for people who have that kind of money, you know, all, all the more you know, power to you. But to spend uh, twenty four ninety nine on this rifle when, when you can get a Brownells BRN sixteen A one for around the twelve hundred mark, uh, which is pretty much just as uh, authentic uh, as, as this one is here, but for half the price. And so we're going to go over the BRN sixteen A one as well, and then I'm going to show you for all you nerds out there like myself, you want to build an M sixteen A one right. I'm going to show you how I did it to build it right, to be to pay the attention to every single solitary detail that is out there, to be able to show you the most accurate representation of a rifle that was manufactured between 1968 and 1985. Now, starting off with this, you will say that there is a generation gap. There are generation gaps with the M16A1. You consider around 1968 or so when it was adopted, uh, there were some initial changes that were made that were changed as time went on. Uh, we're going to go over that. You know, it's particularly is really the butt stock uh, and so forth, some of the finish and uh, some of the barrel uh, stuff as well. But what we're going to do is we're going to go over that uh, with all these different models. We're going to start right off with the muzzle to the butt. First off, looking at the muzzle device. Now, you'll be seeing the, the markings in a minute here. Uh, the markings that they're going for were probably uh, the initial M16A1 markings, probably around 1968, 69, where you still had the Colt AR-15 on there. Now, for as far as the muzzle device could go either way, it could go uh, the three prong or it could go what you see here uh, with the bird cage. Now, Colt has provided you with both uh, the bird cage and the three prong. Now, in reality, it probably should have the three prong on it for that time period, but uh, they give you both. But here's an issue. For $2,499, you have a beautifully made manganese phosphate finished barrel. But you have a black oxide a muzzle device. Both these muzzle devices are black oxide. And if you know the difference between the look of black oxide and manganese phosphate, they are very, very different. You have more of a nice grayish looking here versus a, a black. For that kind of money, you would have expected that they were going to get that, uh, that all these finishes correct. Now the barrel. This is another contention for a lot of us who are, uh, who are, who are certainly kind of sores on these rifles. They went to the trouble to make the proper pencil barrel, proper front sight base. However, they decided they weren't even going to mark it. There are three ways this barrel would be marked. 
First is CMPC, which is Colt Nanoparticle and Proof Tested Chrome Chamber Only. The next would be CMPB for Chrome Nanoparticle Tested Chrome Bore and Chamber. And the third would be CMP Chrome Bore. Well, this one has no markings on it whatsoever. So looking at it, you don't know whether this is a 1 in 12, a 1 in 14, a 1 in 7. You have no idea, out of the fact that they tell you that this is a 1 in, uh, 1 in 12. So to go through all the details of making this a quote, quote, rifle and to not mark the barrel, I think was a major letdown. Uh, that they could not put any of those markings on here. And that's going to be a, that's going to be something we're going to come back to several times over with uh, this rifle is the fact that it has not had the proper markings uh, on it. Now, the next thing we're going to look at is the handguards. Now, these handguards look similar to Brownells, but uh, when you really look at it closely, these are not Brownells. These were made by a different subcontractor. Now, for as far as the feel of them, you know, they have certainly a different feel than the original ones, which you would expect due to the fact that the material these were originally made from is no longer available. That's really, really outdated. However, they, they were very uh, brittle compared to the original ones. In fact, this is not the original set of handguards. The viewer who was very kind to loan this to me, uh, when they were working on some of the stuff, these broke. The teeth on here broke. So he had to go out and buy a brand new set, well, not brand new, brand new old stock, uh, of the original AR-15 M16A1 furniture. These are actually Colt uh, handguards that he bought uh, online. Uh, probably came off of an M16A1 or an AR-15 SP1 or something. But these are actual uh, Colt manufactured. One of the ways you can tell, even if you don't understand the feel of it, when you look at these shields, you'll see where it says left and right. Uh, of course, that's military, so you have to go to the lowest common denominator who can't tell their left from their right. So you're going to have that left and right. Uh, this here, nothing written on the ones that came with it. Uh, also, if you look at the way they were riveted in place on the original ones, these had like little hex bolts on them. So it was it, it was quite different. So... I will say I expect there to be some differences between this and the original just due to the fact that this is so old that you can't uh, really get the newer stuff. You know, also when you look at this uh, from you know, from the years past, there's a lot of M16A1 parts kits that floated around for many, many years. Uh, there was times when you could not give them away. And when you got the, the parts, you know, you, your, your grades ranged from brand new to extremely poor. Um, so you, it would be a luck of the draw for you to find a really, really nice set. Uh, generally, you would want to look at photographs first before you paid for them, and it could be rather expensive. So this rifle does not have original parts on them for as far as the handguard stock and the pistol grip, uh, just due to the fact that it's probably just impossible to do it. So now we'll go back to the uh, slip ring. The slip ring is black. Uh, this slip ring should be the same color as these receivers because all of the uh, parts were anodized, should be anodized to the same color. Now you will get differences in finishes between upper and lower. That's normal, just due to the you know to you know any kind of variances there would be in the in the aluminum forgings themselves. There could be some differences, but you you will have a gray. This is black. Now we're looking at the upper receiver. Now in 2017, when I was at Shot Show and I saw the prototypes, or I don't say prototypes, but I saw the first ones that Colt was showing. What they had there was an original Colt A1 upper receiver that was refinished, and the reason I could tell that was when you looked at the. Uh, well, you'll see a picture here as well. When you looked at the, the, the carrying handle, you saw a forging code of CH, Colt Harvey Aluminum. Now, that has not been made in many, 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 many years. So there's no way that Colt had produced those new, or anybody had produced those new. So there's pretty much no question what happened was, was they took a original receiver and they refinished it. If you look at this one on here, uh, in my opinion, this is a Nodak Spud. Uh, without question. Uh, the one thing is, is the, the NDS was machined off the right-hand side. You can sort of tell by the feel of it. Uh, if you look at where the seam is on here versus an original Colt, you can you can tell Nodak Spud. Uh, and there's just some of the, I don't know, it's sort of weird. If you haven't uh, been around these a lot and known how they feel, how the machining was done, uh, it's sort of hard to tell. But when you have, you pretty much know the stuff when you see it. So it looks like what we have here is a Nodak Spud upper receiver. Uh, properly finished, I will say. This is the proper M16A1 finish. The forward assist that we have on here is an original Colt. If you were to look at the uh, the current ones that are being made by Bushmaster and so forth, guys, I can't tell you, but you can feel it. There's a difference in the way that they feel, uh, that you can tell the difference from an original one and a not-so. The one on here is an original feel. Um, these are either original ones or they had somebody do them who knew what they were doing. The next thing on the upper receiver we want to talk about is the ejection port dust cover. Now, this is the proper ejection port dust cover, but it's black. So it looks like they got original ones and they refinished them uh, to more of a black configuration. Uh, so now we're going to take a look at the lower receiver. The lower receiver, 
I'm almost uh, positive uh, that this is a NODAC uh, with, without question. Um, Colt has never made a semi-automatic only receiver that has stop notches, uh, that had the fence. So this, this obviously was made by somebody else. We're going to look at the right side first. Uh, you have the normal uh, magaz magazine fence uh, around the magazine release button. Uh, you have the proper uh, machining around here, but this is A1. And now we're going to get into the trigger. The trigger is not Colt. Uh, the trigger is one of more, the more aftermarket, which, uh, again, this is not a Colt rifle, so you wouldn't expect to see the original Colt parts. Now, I was also very disappointed in the trigger guard as well. This trigger guard is black. It is not of uh, the charcoal gray, which it was supposed to be. And looking at the pistol grip, the pistol grip, as I said, these are not going. These are not original. There's, there's just no way they can make them. Uh, it was done very well. Uh, but again, those of you who are used to the way these things feel, you know the difference between an original part and a aftermarket component. Uh, we're going to go over the, the right side first, then we're going to flip everything around. Now the stock. The stock could go either way. Uh, the M16A1s were pretty much at the same time coming out when the changes were made after the congressional hearings to the M16A1, which included the cleaning kit, which meant you would have had the stock on here that would have uh, had a trap door for the installation of the cleaning assembly or for the storage of the cleaning kit. This is a very early uh, XM16E1 type, which has a rubber butt pad and a, a swivel instead of a fixed piece on here. Um, it definitely feels different from the original, which again, you expect this feels more of a, of a plastic than, than the original one did. It was more of a, I don't know how you really describe it. It was uh, sort of a, a fiberite type material or a fiber type material. It was very, it was very, very different. Now, this is definitely not a, a brown owls. If you uh, feel the butt pad on here, this is a lot more rubbery compared to the more plastic that you would find on the, on the brown owls. So this is, this was definitely done by somebody else. Now we'll look at the sling. The sling is completely wrong. Uh, during the Vietnam War, there was a couple slings. First was the cotton sling that was green, uh, which basically an M1 grand sling. Uh, the problem with those in Vietnam was they would rot very easily. That uh, cotton cloth would rot. So they went to a nylon type sling that was the same for as far as having the, the folding clip on it uh, and how it's, it's, it's uh, snapped over the back here. This is a more 1970s uh, Colt silent sling. So again, for 2499 they couldn't give you the proper sling. Uh, that was pretty pretty. Uh, sad itself. So I think what we're going to do now is we're going to flip this over. Uh, by the way, it did come with a single 20-round magazine, which was manufactured uh, in 5 of 13. So we have a plastic follower on here. Again, you would have thought for $2,499 they could have found one or some aluminum followers and had ones that did not have manufacturing dates from uh, from 2013. Now, the one and only thing that you're paying for on here that is really cool is this mark. And I have to say, I was extremely disappointed. If you were to look at the way this mark is done, this is not the original Colt roll mark. Uh, this, the way that it was put on there, as you can see, you will see some letters that are deep, and you'll see some letters you can hardly even see. And the Colt Hartford Horsey is very, very difficult to see because it wasn't, impre you know, wasn't uh, impressed properly. So for $2,499, you didn't even get the most important part, which was the markings uh, properly. If you look over to the side here, you can hardly read uh, Hartford, Connecticut, USA. So that was extremely disappointing. Uh, you know, the, the, the markings that were the most important thing that made this rifle what it was that they did not get right. Now, to my understanding, there's other rifles where it looks better. Um, I have to say the only few that I've seen, they were like this. You would have some uh, very shallow uh, you know, letters and, and numbers, and then you would have some that were very deep. Now, for as far as the way that the serial number is on here, that is extremely light. I would, you know, I actually would wonder if that would meet ATF's uh, standard for as far as how deep something has to be, you know, a serial number has to be engraved. I don't know. But uh, that mark was very disappointing. So if you notice, this does have stop notches. Now, Colt, uh, to this day, has never made a LE or a, a commercial semi-automatic only uh, rifle that had the stop notches not machined off. So my guess is, is, again, this is not a Colt lower receiver. Uh, this was manufactured elsewhere. You do have a auto mark, which is the first time Colt has ever done that. So on the left-hand side, those are the most critical things that I've seen that, that sort of would upset me. Now we're going to take a look at the inside. You're going to see some photographs that I'm going to enter into here. The bolt carrier, another part that I was extremely disappointed in. There was no C located on the, on the left-hand side, which if somebody wants to get technical, you could argue, 
uh, that there's a, there's a good chance that it may not have been there because if you go back in time and when this was being produced, Colt was the only manufacturer of it until around 68, 69. Around 68 and 69 is when uh, the government had a second and third source, GM Hydromatic and Harrington and Richardson. At that point, they had to put on codes so they would know where the parts came from. So a Colt would have a C on it. You can argue it, fine, but in my opinion, this should have had a C marked on it. You'll see photographs as well. But the Bolt, there is no excuse for not having an MP on there. From the day one of the original Model 01 where you had a chrome-plated Bolt carrier, the original chrome-plated bolt carriers had an MP acid etched on it. So it always was a mill spec that every bolt, every barrel had to be uh, mag particle and proof tested um, as per mill spec. There's no MP or mark that's located on the uh, barrel itself or on the front sight base. There's nothing, there's nothing, period. Now, there should be on there a some kind of a, of a verified proof mark on there. The only proof marks that you see on this rifle are the Colt verified proof marks on the right-hand side, which you'll see a photograph of. So their bolt carrier, you know, we can leave, we can argue about that. That's fine. The bolt, absolutely not. There should be an MP on here. There should not an MPC. There should at minimal be an MP on here. If any bolt that's ever been produced by a Colt at any point, it'll either be marked MP for the early ones, and then after they had the second and third sources, it would have MPC on it, and that's what it is to this day for any government. So again, that attention to detail for two thousand four ninety nine was very very disappointing. Then you take a look at the buffer. Well, again, details. Uh, the bumper or the uh, bumper on the back of the, of the buffer should be a reddish color. Now, uh, these are yellowish color of uh, the brand new ones. So there's another detail that was not missed. Now, for $1,200 or $1,500, all the things that I'm mentioning to you at, at this moment, I never would have said a word about. You know, uh, you know, that's, it was, it's a very, for $1,200, $1,500, this rifle is absolutely beautiful. Not for 2499 There is uh, too much fine things that you would expect out of this rifle uh, that, that are not there. So we're going to show you the alternative, which is going to be the Brownells, BRN16A1. A couple years ago, Brownells introduced their Retro Series, which I have to say I have been just totally ecstatic about. They have done some really, really awesome things. Uh, and for as far as what they're doing, they're offering a rifle at a thousand, you know, you can get them anywhere from a thousand to twelve ninety nine, uh, which some people would, would say is too expensive for a retro rifle. But in the reality, all the parts that you see on these rifles, all the Brownells rifles are brand new components manufactured today. They had to spend the time and the money to go back and, and design and manufacture obsolete components. So you have a brand new rifle uh, that's capable of being fired without any issue. Now, the rifle that you see here is sort of the BRN16A1. This is one that I had built on one of my videos. Uh, I had made a couple changes to it, so it's not exactly the only changes that we have here. On this one here, I have the three-prong suppressor instead of the uh, birdcage, what it comes with. And this lower receiver, this is one of the uh, ones I got is a uh, second. Uh, this was this has a safe and fired. It was a mistake by the manufacturer. Uh, the Brownells had, you know, they had to do the engraving. So safe and fire. So this is not one of the normal BRN lower receivers. This is one of the blemished ones. So that is the only difference between this one uh, and the actual BRN16A1 you would get. So let's take a look at this. Brownells has designed and remanufactured both the handguards, the stock, and the pistol grip. Now, for as far as the feel of them, they feel very, very well made. You know, the uh, the, stock, the handguards are a little bit different because it's a different material. This is a more modern Zytel type polymer, far stronger than what you originally had. But like I said, we can't, you know, go back and use obsolete materials. So that's, uh, that's very, very important. Now, looking at the barrel on this one, this is uh, manufactured by Faxon. Faxon makes incredible barrels. This is a true 1 in 12 inch twist barrel. If you remove the handguards, you'll be able to see all the marks on it. It is a nitride coated barrel, but they put an additional black finish over it. This is a proper front sight base, pr a proper slip ring. Now, the only place that Brownells has not gotten it right is, is in the color. This should be a charcoal gray finish. And all the guns that uh, Brownells has put through in their retro line all had more of a black uh, matte finish. Now, they've started to do some corrections on that. Uh, the newest versions of the BRN601 uh, has come through in gray. You're starting to see it coming up on their uh, web pages where you can choose between black and gray. So they've corrected, they're correcting the issue with having the wrong color. That's just part of the evolution of uh, the BRN system. You have NODAC upper and lower receivers. 
These are not uh, manufactured by Nodak, just the forgings came from. Brownells it goes ahead and they machine them themselves to the exact specifications of the M16A1. Very, very well made. Now, for as far as the ejection port cover, the first rifles that came out from Brownells uh, had standard uh, current production ejection port dust covers. They now manufacture the original M16A1 and M16 ejection port covers, so they're manufacturing the outdated uh, you, know, you know, retro ejection port covers, which you'll see a photograph of uh, the current one. Uh, standard teardrop forward assist. Now, another issue that has changed. If you look at the side here, you'll see there's a tick on here on the safety. Brownells is now produced and manufacturing, and they've replaced all the ones with a new obsolete, if you, if you would say, uh, safety without the tick on it. So that's proper. So Brownells continues to update these rifles as time goes on. Uh, in all the parts that you're seeing here that they're correcting, you can buy as replacement parts and upgrade your, your current Brownells one. So you have a good stock on here. You have the, you have the, the polymer on the back with no trap door. Uh, so you have uh, a very, very accurate uh, version of the M16A1, around $1,200. So with the change in color, you have an exact duplicate here uh, of, of the rifle in every way. Of course, the markings are different, but if you look at the rifle that we just saw for you know, 2500 you don't even have the proper markings on it. The only markings you have on the left-hand side is cold. Uh, that's really the only difference between the two rifles. So you have to decide for yourself, how much am I willing to spend for that name on the side uh, versus a, you know, a, you know, just as accurate of a rendition of the rifle. Now we're going to show you something a little bit different. What we're going to show you now is for the p a person like me, who is a complete gun nerd, who absolutely loves and adores the M16A1, how do we make one that is an exact duplicate or an exact replicate of the M16A1 as much as we legally can? What I'm going to show you here is my M16A1 retro rifle that I built. Uh, and this one is which, I don't know what this would cost. The reason being is because the parts that I have on here are all original Colt uh, parts. Now, a lot of these I've had sitting around for years uh, and, you know, in boxes, uh, so I put everything together. I still don't believe this rifle would have cost anywhere near $2,500. Uh, but we're going to take a look at all the details because this one here is exact. Now, this one was designed as a Colt M16A1, but it would be more of the export model because the markings that I have on the side, the side is an 80% lower receiver that uh, I manufactured, and it has the export marks. The export marks just say Colt M16A1 556 NATO. So um, that's the only difference between that and the Colt that you have there. I don't have the property U.S. government ones on here. So we're going to go from front to rear on this one. What we have here is an original 1970s, early 80s, manufactured Colt M16A1 barrel. Now this barrel is marked CMP chrome bore. That is one of the three ways that it would be proper. We have a birdcage flash suppressor, which is the exact same finish, which is correct. These are original Colt M16 handguards that were manufactured, I think these are probably around 1966 or so. Uh, these came out of, a, of, of some Air Force rifles that were being destroyed. Uh, but this is an original, uh, these are original M16, M16A1 handguards. Slip ring we have on here. Now, the slip ring on several of these components, you're going to see the slip ring, you're going to see the upper receiver, the lower receiver, and the charging handle, and trigger guard. These are all original Colt parts that were sent to U.S. anodizing, and Victor over there refinished these in the proper and exact M16A1 charcoal gray finished. So, all original parts, but they've all been uh, refinished to the proper uh, gray finish. Now, for as far as the metal parts were concerned, all the metal parts, such as the bolt catch, the magazine release, the safety, uh, the charging handle latch, the rear sights, uh, were all sent to John Thomas, who does retro arms. Actually, they were all refinished with the original Colt gray finish. So they are all gray as they were supposed to be when they were sold, not black. Again, no, that was, that's the degree of the attention to detail that I had. Now, this upper receiver was from a rifle from probably around 1972, 73. You'll see it has a CK forging coat or Colt Kaiser aluminum. So this is an original uh, Colt upper receiver that has been refinished. You have the standard M16A1 rear sights, actual Colt charging handle, Colt charging handle with a refinished Colt latch. The forward assist you see on here is an original Colt uh you know, you know, probably 1968, 69 or so uh, vintage. It's original finish. There was no need to refinish that. Same thing with the ejection port dust cover. This is an original M16A1, probably from the late 70s, early 80s, 
ejection port dust cover. It was not refinished because there was no need for it. Um, all in, it looked like it's in new condition. This is an original M16A1 buttstock post-1969. Uh, this has the trap door, which you would have for the cleaning cleaning kit, which would be proper for any M16A1 that was manufactured, probably say after 1968. We have the proper uh, non-swiveling rear, rear swivel on here. This is an original M16, M16A1 pistol grip. This probably was uh, circa 1980 or so. It's got some wear on it, but again, it's, 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 it still is original. Now, the trigger group that's in here, this is LMT. Uh, there's a reason for that. We're going to show you some photos here. You're going to see there's two different versions of the uh, semi-automatic only uh, trigger and disconnector. Now, the first one you're going to see, uh, which I believe will be on your right, is the original AR-15 system where you had the disconnector spring moved forward and the notch moved forward on the disconnector so you could not insert a fully automatic disconnector into the closed end uh, AR-15 semi-mac only trigger assembly. Well, there was a problem with that. It was first noted in the carbines because you didn't have enough leverage on there to, uh, to keep up with the cycle rate, so you would get an extra shot or two uh, when that spring got a little bit worn. So what they did was uh, Colt moved back, drilled another hole, and put a spring that was the same location as the standard full auto. And they took the disconnector and they, they shaved the tail off it and they inserted it in there and the problem went away. You had the proper leverage that was on there. Uh, however, the first uh, several generations of the semi-matic only AR-15 Sporters had that original one in there. It was as a, as a recall at one time, as a, as a safety recall. So Colt ended up changing over to that, uh, to the proper one they did for the carbine. So that problem totally went away. And you'll see that change uh, in the photographs as well. So I went with the uh, more modern, uh, the safe, uh, the proper way uh, to have your, your trigger group. And we're going to take a look in the inside. We have a modern 1985 buffer in there as well. And for as far as the bolt carrier is concerned, we have a proper C on the, on the left side, which is, uh, this is a Colt bolt carrier group. And we also have the MPC on the bolt as well. So the rifle that you're seeing here, every single part on it, with the exception of the fire control group and the lower receiver, are original Colt M16A1 from the original era. They're all real parts that were uh, re either refinished or not refinished if they didn't need it. Uh, you have an 80% lower receiver. Um, the 80% lower receiver was manufactured uh, by me, and the engravings were done by the brace man, who, uh, who does the best uh, engraving uh, as possible in the industry. And there's nobody that comes even close to him. You look at a lot of the lasers that are done, it looks terrible. Now we're going to take a look at the left side of this. So, so now looking at the left side, you'll see uh, the way the markings were done. This, as, I, as we stated before, is the Colt export marks. Looking out here, you'll see the marks. As we stated before, these are the export marks. If this was a U.S. government rifle, you would have the Colt Hartford Horsey. Below that, it would say Property U.S. Government M16A1, and it would have a, 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 the serial number. Uh, all the guns that did not go to the U.S. government that were sold for other countries or law enforcement or in, back in the days when it was still free, uh, when you could buy them uh, as a Class 3, uh, this is the way that will be marked with the, uh, the Colt and the M16A1 that's on there. These were done by John Brace. John Brace does the finest marks in the industry on 80% lower receivers. He doesn't do the laser. He does an actual engraving process, and this process looks just like a roll mark. Uh, if you look at the lasers that people are doing, it does not look right. The way that they cut with like the burning, you know, it, it does not look authentic whatsoever. It really, really ruins uh, some of these retro type rifles trying to do it. However, I do understand uh, in more recent days, uh, Colt has gone after a lot of these guys who do the engraving uh, for patent infringement or for trademark infringement. So people are no longer allowed to do these marks. Uh, this was done about a year ago, so prior to Colt's uh, cease and desist. So I don't really know where the where everything sits at that, but I'll tell you if any of you guys want any markings that are done, probably other than Colt, um, John Brace is I, he is the guy to do it. He just does an absolute beautiful work. He's done uh, Dimaco rifles for me. Uh, he did a T91 for me. He just does absolute uh, beautiful work. So we're not going to shoot these guns. There's absolutely no reason to. Uh, you know, this gentleman who was nice enough to send uh, the Colt rifle to me here, um, there's no reason to shoot it. Now, when I say it is uh, just like the Colt Expanse, let me explain to you what I mean. This was made outside 
Colt and just has their name on it. This was not made in the Hartford factory. That's what I mean. It has no uh, bearing on its quality. For as far as its quality, the way this rifle is put together, it's put together very, very well. I bet you this thing will be a very nice shooter. Uh, there's no need to shoot it because what we're talking about here is, is building the clones, uh, having uh, as close to the detail uh, as you can get. My only pr problem I have with the Colt rifle is for the price tag that it has, it should be this. It should be all those details, everything proper for $2,500. If they were to manufacture this uh, and sell it for the, you know, the same price as the, like the Brown L's or a little bit more expensive, I probably would have bought one just because, again, it's my favorite. Now, getting back to SHOT Show 2017 when uh, these guys were interviewed, there's some things that just don't make sense here. First off, you're saying $2,500 because you had to retool. No, you didn't. This is being made by somebody else. Second of all, if in fact that was the case, why would you be limited to 2,500 rifles? If you're going to spend the money to do all the new tooling, why would you do that for 2,500 rifles? You would you retool to do and it, you know to to go into production of something. So that really didn't jive either. Uh, I think the reality was was the you know they decided they wanted to make some good coin. Uh, you know again based on their name, uh, they went to U.S. Army and said build us the rifle. And uh, you can put our roll mark on it, and then we'll package it up in Colt material. We'll advertise it as the true Colt. Well, it's not a true Colt. It's uh, it's basically just uh, somebody else's work with their name on it. And for that kind of money, you know, they really could have made a killing on this. If they would have sold this for a reasonable price, they could have literally made a killing. But this, unfortunately, is just more and more bad decisions, bad business decisions by Colt. Uh, I really don't get it. And a lot of people who would look at this and say, I can't justify it. You know, you look at how well Brown Ells is doing with their BRN 16A1 because you're getting a modern rifle. It's a modern produced rifle that has all the attention to detail and all this, all the little components. As we said earlier, the original ones, uh, there was some things that uh, weren't right where they need to be. And Brown Ells has attacked that and they're manufacturing those parts new. $1,200 for that rifle uh, is an excellent, excellent deal. Not to mention you have the ability to buy an XM16E1 version. You have the 601. Uh, you have an XM177E2. Now you see at SHOT Show, now you have the introduction of the, the BRN Proto. Uh, you have also a 605. Uh, you see uh, all the guns that Brian Ells is coming out with, just taking this history back and making guns that gives you the ability to have some of this history is pretty damn incredible. Um, and they're getting better every, every time at making those original parts. So I hope you all enjoyed this video. Um, I know it's a lot of information to take in, but again, those of us who are nerds, you know, it's very important for us to have all those details done and done right. So uh, if you enjoyed this video, please click like, please subscribe, even better share. Thank you.